Well, welcome everybody to this session. Uh, we're thrilled that you could make it today. Um, we are going to have a very uh, packed agenda with the opportunity here from many of our speakers that I'd like to briefly introduce first. Um, and we will have time for questions and answers hopefully at the end. If there's anything that comes up for you uh, tech wise, we have um, an AFP volunteer, Danny, who you can uh, chat with um, separately and we welcome you here today. So my name is Allison. I work with Alliance for Peace Building and I'm thrilled to um, help moderate this session. Uh, we have a wonderful agenda planned for you um, that includes many organizations all over the world. So I would like to pass it off immediately because I know that we are very short on time. So I'm gonna introduce first um, Alexander Bramble with Inclusive Peace who is going to talk about faith-based actors and formal peace and political transition processes. So Alex, I'm going to uh, pass this over to you and uh, make sure uh, that everyone is able to keep on time. I'll just uh, shoot a little message if we're, we're getting over so that we have enough time for everybody. So welcome and uh, I look forward to uh, moderating the session. Thanks a lot, Alison. First, uh loath to start with a housekeeping point but can everybody see my screen yes uh can you make it a full screen yeah. please yeah, yeah yeah i was just wait, waiting for the confirmation i will put it into slideshow mode Is that better yes good thank you wonderful okay so hi everybody um it's a pleasure to be with you today um as Alison said, I'm going to present some of the findings from uh, some research that we've been doing in collaboration with USIP and ICRD over the past couple of years, um, which has examined the involvement of faith-based actors in formal peace and political transition processes. Um, so it's specifically focused on the questions on the screen. Um, as Alison alluded to, the agenda is action packed and even just a brief overview of each of these questions would be pretty tough in 10 minutes. So what I'm going to try and do is well, what I'm going to do is to put brief summaries up on the slides and then kind of cherry pick certain more relevant and interesting findings to talk about in a little bit of detail. But um, please obviously ask about any points of further interest uh, during the Q&A. Um, so very quickly, there are various types of faith-based actors involved in um, formal processes. Uh, it's important to note here that there are often several different types of faith-based actors involved in a particular context, either simultaneously or continuously or overlapping or discreetly during different phases of the process. Um, Faith-based actors' involvement in formal processes is spread pretty evenly from what we found across the pre-negotiation, negotiation, and implementation phases. Uh, there's a proportionally slightly higher level, level of inclusion of faith-based actors during implementation when they're particularly involved in um, things like monitoring mechanisms and truth and reconciliation processes and bodies. Um, an interesting thing to note is that faith-based actors are often some of the earliest actors to engage, particularly in dialogue and mediation efforts, um, often preceding the start of official peace negotiations. And this is one of the factors that we found that in many cases has paved the way for their effective long-term involvement and greater influence over the process. Um, one last point to note that I'm sure will resonate with many of you. Um, it's, it was interesting when we looked into the kind of nature of the conflict, but there are many conflicts that are sometimes categorized as being religious conflicts, but they're in fact political conflicts in which the fault lines of the conflict can be identified along ethnic, religious or ethno-religious lines and are often um, identified as such um, by conflict parties for kind of propaganda mobilization purposes. Um, in terms of rationales for why faith-based actors choose to get involved in formal process, I mean, these are all fairly self-explanatory. Um, just a note on cost-benefit analysis. So, I mean, like any actor, faith-based actors often weigh up um, 
the sort of pros and the cons, costs, benefits of their involvement in formal peacemaking. And the, the kind of factors that they, they, they base that analysis on are, well, among them are the possibility of repression, which is intrinsically linked to the level of religious freedom in a country, um, the breadth of their membership, um, the gravity of the situation facing their communities. And again, as you would naturally imagine, I mean, the di this, this, this is often a dilemma and the balancing act is hard. Um, Pope Francis's own experience in Argentina under the military dictatorship is a good illustration of this, and it's um, touched on in a part of the film The Two Popes, if uh, any of you haven't seen that and are so inclined. Um, in terms of why other actors um, choose to solicit or engage faith-based actors, um, I get the um, some of these are, are, are pretty interlinked. So, long-standing involvement, uh, a kind of traditional history of faith-based actors' involvement in peacemaking or peacebuilding is linked to both their legitimacy and their organizational capacity and resources. Um, and legitimacy, as we'll see later, is I mean, it's both a rationale and a kind of factor that determines influence, and it's also multifaceted as a rationale in so far as um, faith-based actors are solicited because of the legitimacy that they often enjoy in the eyes of their constituents and even society more broadly to be involved in these kinds of processes. And that in turn can confer legitimacy on the process itself. Um, so this slide is, um, sorry, it's a bit, um, visually packed, but it's, um, so it's, uh, these are the two main prisms of analysis that we used in the research, which are two analytical frameworks that we use a lot in across uh, all of our work at Inclusive Peace. Um, and they're analytical frameworks for analyzing the participation of unarmed actors beyond the main conflict parties to a conflict, uh, beyond the main parties to a conflict, um, to analyzing their involvement in peace and political transition processes and peace building. Um, one looks at the functions, so sort of roles that um, civil society actors, broadly speaking, civil society can perform. And the other one looks at the kind of the ways, the modalities that they can be involved in and around formal processes. Um, the idea of taking them collectively is to use them as a lens to examine how actors like faith-based actors can influence um, formal peace and political transition processes. Um, just a quick summary, I've put some, I mean, I've put some examples in brackets on the slide, but um, the sort of overarching results were that, yeah, faith-based actors play a number of different roles and functions across all modalities of formal peace processes. By far the most common function or role is uh, our mediation is mediation followed by advocacy. Um, in terms of mediation, faith-based actors mainly served as mediators in conflicts where there wasn't a central religious dimension. Um, it's also extremely interesting to note that like uh, um, kind of the type of faith-based actors involved in a process can evolve over time, the specific or individual actors or body or faith-based bodies roles can also change over the course of a process. So the same uh, faith-based actor can perform a number of functions across a number of modalities, either constantly over the course of a process or um, different roles at different times. Um, quickly moving on to the factors. Uh, these are some of the factors that determine faith-based actors' ability to influence processes. Um, as you'll notice, we're well, going extremely quickly. They a lot of them overlap with the rationales for faith-based actors engaging or being solicited by other actors. Um, it's interesting to note that faith-based actors frequently engage in, in. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> it's a. Uh, I was saying that it's, um, on the point about selection criteria and procedures, um, like other. Actors, faith-based actors frequently engage in self-selection, um, especially in terms of activities 
again, around formal and informal mediation and facilitation, uh, back channel diplomacy, and also in relating to advocacy efforts. Um, fairly intuitively, where faith-based actors mobilized in a way that was tantamount to self-selection, their influence was clearly greater. Um, and just some overall findings uh, to finish. I think I'm just about in the 10 minutes. Um, so yeah, the, the sort of main takeaways, we, the, the, the headline takeaways that we found that in cases where faith-based actors mobilize for peace, their inclusion in these kind of processes can generate greater buy-in, increase the likelihood of, re of reaching a negotiated settlement and of that settlement being implemented. So in short, it increases the chances of achieving sustainable positive peace. Um, as I hopefully have made clear even in that, in that statement, kind of internal and external mobilization is a key first step for influencing formal processes. Um, and this mobilization of faith-based actors can occur through existing structures, such as churches, um, or through the formation of new a new forum organization. And these kind of structures are often intercommunal. Um, so like interreligious councils are the most obvious example of um, interfaith bodies that have been created uh, in and around formal peace processes. Um, this also, I mean, on the the the, half gla the glass half empty side of that is that um, intercommunal structures seem to lessen the chance for any one faith based actor to instrumentalize their inclusion, for instance, to seek power in any post negotiation structures. But the glass half full side is that, as with politicians who are willing and able to cross the aisle, um, working across the interreligious community rather than just within their own religious community is a very different mode of operation for faith-based actors and it's one that requires particular characteristics that sets actors that can do it apart from the majority and it's these kinds of faith-based actors who see each other as equals in the civic space and that are willing to work together interreligiously or multi-religiously um, that are best placed to positively influence initiatives like formal peace processes and help to shape society's pathways to lasting peace. Uh, yeah, apologies for whizzing through all of that. Like I said, very happy to answer any questions um, at the end of a session or outside of a session. Please feel free to get in touch with me or anyone at our organization. And just to say that a full report of this research is going to be coming out in the next couple of months in the USIP Peacework series. So please do look out for that. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Alex. You set a very high standard for staying within your time limit. So I appreciate that very much. Um, if you have any questions for Alex, feel free to put those in the chat and I'll make sure to collect those and um, address them directly um, during our question and answer time. So. Uh, like I mentioned at the top of the session, we have almost a sandwich approach to our uh, panel today, where we're starting off with one really big um, kind of framing of our idea today, and we are ending with our food for thought, and in between is um, all the meat of what people are doing around the world uh, with interreligious uh, peace building and dialogue. So I'd like to pass this along to uh, John from the Rossing Center, who is going to talk uh, more about uh, best practices and what things have been learned in the field for that. So, uh, John, I pass that to you. Feel Thank you so much. Question. Thank you so much, Alison, and also uh, Alex for that. Hopefully, uh, my quick and short talk will sort of complement what Alex started us off with. Uh, and I will be focusing on, on perhaps some methods that, that we at the Rossing Center for Education and Dialogue use. And this is something that we have learned from our own experience. Um, for those of you who want to learn more about the Rossing Center, uh, please feel free to, to visit our website. We're based in Jerusalem and we work in Israel and Palestine. But before I start with some of the um, uh, ideas that we have in terms of doing interreligious dialogue and the methods behind it, I want to share a quick story, which I think will lay out uh, some of the challenges that we often face in our field. I uh, graduated uh, with a master's degree, a master's degree in uh, interreligious dialogue. And I finally got invited to this huge interreligious dialogue conference. 
I was so excited. I couldn't wait to go to this conference. Uh, I could put some of the things I learned into practice. Um, and this was such a big conference that they invited people from all around the world. They paid for our flights. They put us in nice hotels and they brought some big names to come and speak to us. And I walk into the big hall. There was about 800 people there. And one of the first sessions is a panel of around uh, four, four men um, on, on, on the panel. And the second speaker speaks for about half an hour. And his main message to this huge audience of people within the field of interreligious dialogue is that we need to smile more, right? We, they flew people from all around the world, experts in the field of interreligious dialogue. And our first session is about how we need to smile more, right? If we smile more, all of our problems, all of our differences, all of our tensions would disappear. Now, I don't know how uh, you felt when you heard what I just said, but I was extremely disappointed, right? I believe that smiling is good and, and, and important, but of course it does not solve uh, some of the tensions and conflicts that we see in um, our own backyard. And especially for me coming from Palestine and Israel, smiling is not gonna solve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, nor will it solve the different interreligious tensions that we have here in the Middle East. So what were some of the challenges that we faced? Well, the Rosting Center sort of has been working in interreligious dialogue for quite some time now. And it has developed a, a, a model, a method that focuses on engaging people where they are and from what en any background they come from. And this new methodology for interreligious dialogue that we have at the organization is called healing hatred. And the healing hatred methodology, I think, answers some of the challenges that I faced in this big interreligious dialogue. And I'll leave you with three points and hopefully uh, you'll be able to, to, to remember them and reflect about them. And I'm also happy to hear some of your feedback perhaps in the chat or later. The first one is that the healing hatred methodology does not target clergy for interreligious dialogue. On the contrary, what we try to do is work with any person, whether they be doctors, students, unemployed, um, clergy or not, we want to work with any person that is interested in engaging in dialogue with someone from a different faith or practice, right? On that panel that I went to, it was just clergy. What we try and do is work with any person, the everyday person within our context. So that's the first point. The way we need to, I think, shift the way we do into religious dialogue is to reach every single person. Now, if you're not going to work with clergy, the brilliant thing that you, uh, one of the results out of this is that you're going to work also with a, a population that has been neglected by the interreligious dialogue movement, especially in the West, and that is women. If you don't only engage with, with uh, the clergy who tend to be in some religious traditions and some uh, cultures, men, now you're opening it up to the other half of the population. Right. And this is also to do with the history of the um, interreligious movement that comes out of the West and then sort of exported to other areas uh, around the globe that has also ignored, ignored a lot of indigenous forms of interreligious dialogue. So when we engage people in our healing hatred methodology, we're engaging, first of all, in our uh, laity and we're engaging women and anybody. The third point. Precisely because you engage the laity and women, other topics come into the discussion when you're engaging in interreligious dialogue. When usually you bring very educated, at times powerful, perhaps elite clergy members to engage in dialogue, they discuss matters that, you know, that relate to them or their positions and are often blinded to some other immediate concerns that the population wants to engage in. So within the healing hatred methodology, when we bring the laity together, we bring any person from any background together in our discussion, what we try and do is connect the personal conflicts, which are important, 
when it comes to interreligious dialogue, but we connect them to so social and political conflicts, right? Because at times it's not necessarily um, a brilliant argument that will convince me from becoming from becoming a fascist to a non-fascist is not necessarily a, an amazing argument, but some interpersonal experiences, traumas, hurts that I've experienced throughout my life. And when you try and connect the social and political also to the personal, it allows for better reflection for the participant themselves. I will uh, sort of close it up here just because uh, I'm limited in time, but that was just sort of a small opening to um, how we think at the Rossing Center, we need to change the way we do interreligious dialogue using this new method called that we've developed called healing hatred. Uh, and I'm happy to discuss this more and more but if we truly want to make our contexts and the world a better place, a more a place where the peace and justice uh, prosper, we really, really need to rethink the way we are uh, engaging. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thrilled that you were able to uh, lead us into thinking about um, healing from hatred and potentially even discussing topics like um forgiveness and things like that um later on that's a much bigger conversation but um thrilled to have those seats for us to think on um i'd like to introduce next our esteemed panel from uh northern iraq and another example of how um on the ground practitioners are uh incorporating interfaith practices indigenous practices into um in increasing stability across conflict areas so I'm gonna um, save my time and of course, pass that along to you immediately. Uh, welcome and we're thrilled that you're here. Thank you, Alison. Thank you. Uh, we'll share screen. So our project is entitled Support to Traditional Cultural Practices in Northern Iraq. In between 2014 and 2017, ISIS targeted minority communities living in Northern Iraq, including Christian Yazidis, Shebek, Turkmen, and Kakeis. In this project foregrounds the linkage between cultural meaning and agricultural landscapes to examine the confounded social, cultural, agricultural, and economic effects of the ISIS occupation on ethnic and religious minority com communities. We have four main objectives of uh, the project. Firstly, identify culturally valuable agricultural resources for the minorities. Then secondly, determine the impact of ISIS occupation on these resources. Thirdly, assist groups to in re-establishing the production of these resources, and finally strengthen the institutional capacity of University of Doha in terms of research and agricultural extension. We have the project area two districts, uh, Hamdani and Turkey, and we have one sub-districts that's Bashika. During phase one, that was the data collection. We interviewed more than a thousand farmers, and we did key informant interviews with more than 100 religious figures and community leaders. And based on the phase one results and after consultation with our partners, we have identified a few avenues for the implementation phase, uh, including firstly, uh, some uh, political and community advocacy <laughs> efforts. Then uh, also we have the white lands uh, activities and also we have the agricultural extension efforts and also finally we have the marketing uh, analysis for some uh, products i would like to invite firstly our uh, first panelist dr umran umar to talk about who is the leader of the advocacy team and i'd like to ask you dr umran what peaceful coexistence related actions have you already carried out in the region and how can we promote peaceful coexistence between different groups? Yeah, 
Thank you very much, Junash. Uh, thanks, Alison. Uh, uh, actually, uh, in order to identify the problems in this area as uh, and to come out with some solutions and projects, we've conducted the advocacy group, conducted different activities, including small group uh, meetings, uh, about 120 meetings so far. Uh, we've also conducted three accountability and awareness uh, sessions uh, uh, for Hamdaniya, Telkef, and Bashika. We've also produced some videos, posters to uh, promote peaceful coexistence, in addition to producing policy briefs and uh, practical recommendations for local authorities. As a result, we found that the uh, situation before and uh, after the Islamic State is different. As before, uh, I said there were no big issues uh, negatively affecting peaceful coexistence and uh, trust between different groups. However, uh, during and uh, after the IS uh, period, the situation has changed for bad, as particularly during the IS era, the uh, area had witnessed mass destruction and uh, mass migration, particularly in Christians and Yazidis uh, places. Therefore, there has been tensions between different groups, distrust among them, uh, as well as the Christians and Yazidis views of Muslims and Islam has changed. There were also fear among them to return to their uh, homes and lands, as uh, particularly because the ICE ideology is still there, and also people who supported them and help them are still there, and some of them also uh, in powerful position. Uh, therefore, there has been continuous fear, migration, and demographic change, in addition to the existence of uh, hate speech, particularly among some religious uh, figures uh, and imams, and sometimes even politicians, particularly during elections uh, time. Uh, having said that, in order to tackle these problems and promote peaceful coexistence, uh, it is very necessary to increasingly and regularly conduct dialogue meetings between different groups, uh, elders as well as young generation, uh, in order also to clear misunderstanding between them, uh, using a media platform is very necessary, particularly neutral media, as the existing one is mostly affiliated to political and religious agendas. Education is uh, very crucial, particularly in terms of capacity building for teachers and curriculum uh, development, uh, targeting young generation or focusing uh, mostly on young generation is, is very important uh, as this generation is the least that has been affected by ICE ideology. And finally, tightening procedures on uh, religious figures and their discourses uh, is very important in, in order to minimize the negative impact of their discourses on the society in general. Uh, and on young generation in particular. This is all I wanted to say, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Omran. I would like to invite Dr. Hassan Najman, who is leading the White Lands team. I would like to ask you, Dr. Hassan, can you describe the role of White Lands in cultural practices in Nainaba Plain? And do White Lands play a role in promoting social cohesion among? the various minority groups in Nineveh Plains? And finally, what are your team's activity to restore the valuable agricultural resources? Okay, thank you, Dr. Nishman, for the inviting. Actually, uh, both agriculture uh, practices and collecting the wild plants um, have a, a deeply rooted practices or can be considered as a deeply rooted practices uh, in the area and the context, for example, of the ethnobotany, which means the relationship between the human and the wild plants, uh, during the spring, thousands of the people of the, uh, the, the local communities from different ethno-religious groups in the Nineveh plant, they are usually visiting the nature in order to collecting the wild plants and for different purposes. And sometimes the, the, the reason or the purposes behind collecting differ or vary among the ethno-religious groups in the area. 
But in general, one can say that the main purpose is because of the role that the wilder plants play in their diet system. And also, they are usually using in their um, animal husbandry. Sometimes many wilder plants can be used in the cosmetic and beauty materials. Um, and also can be considered as a seasonally uh, generating income for the poor families. And there is a certain uh, species of the wild plants can also be into in the religious ceremonies and the rituals. So in general, one can say that wild plants actually, uh, they have a very influence role and in they're supporting the cultural practices and the Nineveh plants. Uh, you know, wild plants actually, as we found when we when we conducted our survey, that we found that wild plants can can increase or enhance the social cohesion, uh, because you know people in the area actually visiting the nature within the groups. You can find the family members, you can find the friends, relatives, neighbors. So during the collecting the wild plants, there's a kind of connection. There's a kind of a conversation among the within the same minority or even across the minorities. And also many times wild plants can be used in a traditional food and a traditional medicine. So when people sharing the knowledge and the resources of them, so it make like uh, enhancing the social cohesion among them. As well as uh, buying and selling the wild edible plants in the local markets also can make like a mutual benefits benefits among the uh, religious or minorities uh, living in the Nineveh. Uh, about our products, actually, uh, we already conducted, as I say, uh, 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 comprehensive survey, and we found that there is a need for increasing the knowledge about the cultural practices among the different um, age of loss of the of the minorities. So so we uh, made many posters, uh, digital stories, leaflets, policy brief, and also videos. And also we are already establishing, according to our knowledge, for the first time a digital hair value in the University of the Rock in order to collect the wild plant specimen that they are culturally va culturally valuable. So we can. Uh, uh, keep them and, uh, and upload them digitally so it will be available for the whole academists uh, over the Iraq or, or, or even for anyone who are interested. Uh, regarding our other group, which is uh, agricultural extension, say, so they already, the, the main objective behind, behind their work in the area is to um, uh, determine or identify the, the resource and agricultural resources available there and what are the main challenges facing improving these agricultural resources in order to support the farmer, local farmers, and increase uh, their productivity. Um, so for that, they already completed a comprehensive survey and accordingly, actually, they established a training course for the local farmers. The training course is actually covering different agricultural uh, topics, so they already um, uh, finished a questionnaire of uh, uh, 23 villages with a total of 261 and they trained uh, 311 farmers and also they start starting uh, a staff training for 61 if they already finished it. Uh, and this is uh, about their products so they already uh, made a posters, leaflets, guided, guidance and videos and also uh, submitting articles. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Hassan, and thank you, Dr. Omran. At the end, we would like to thank USAID and Desert Parts for funding this project, and thank you, the audience, for listening to our project. We are welcoming any question from your side. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your presentation. You definitely uh, reminded us about how indigenous practices uh, differ across contexts, but how they can be certainly incorporated into social cohesion projects. So thank you so much for uh, your contribution. And a reminder again for the audience, if you have any questions for any of our speakers, feel free to put those in the chat and we'll incorporate them into um, the time for questions and answers. Wonderful. So our last presentation before we jump into that more open format of conversation is from Coast Interfaith Council of Clerics um, in Kenya. So I'm going to uh, save my time and pass that to you. We look forward to 
um, the, the ideas that you're going to present for us and the questions that you're going to ask us to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Alison, for inviting us to course Interfaith Council of Clary. Uh, our presentation will be in two parts. First, we'll showcase a video uh, that will be talking about engaging the mind. Then after the video, I will pick it up from there. So thank you. Akili zetu ni vifaa venye nguvu, vifaa venye uwezo wa kufikiri kwa kina, kwa ubunifu na kuweza kutatua matatizo. Lakini vile vile vinaweza kubadilishwa kwa urahisi. Katika huu ulimwengu wetu wa kisasa, watu wanajawa na habari nyingi na wakati mwingine wanakosa hata muda wa kuweza kufikiria baadhi ya mambo ambayo wanaambiwa. Athari hii ya kutofikiria inaweza kufanya jamii yetu kushawishiwa kiurahisi na wale wanaotaka kuwashawishi. Wahusika wa vurugu mara nyingi hutumia urongo na ukweli potofu ili kuendeleza ajenda zao. Kwa mfano, kukua kwa vikundi vya kigaidi na watu wenye misimamo mikali umechochewa na urongo na ukweli uliopotoka. Vikundi hivi vinatumia hofu na mahangaiko ya watu ili kuendeleza ajenda zao. Vile vile wakati wa uchaguzi wagombea wanaweza kupotosha ukweli au kutoa ahadi za urongo ili kuwashawishi wapiga kura hata baada ya yote haya matumaini yapo viongozi wa kidini wako katika mstari wa mbele kuhamasisha jamii kuhusu jumbe za kuaminika wanatumia mimbar na madabaho yao kudhibitisha na kupambanua mambo yasiyoeleweka jamii lina jukumu ya kuja pamoja ili kudhibitisha jumbe wanazopewa na kuzuia kuenea kwa urongo kufanya mazungumzo ya heshima na umakinifu jamii inaweza kujikinga na urongo na ukweli nusu kusoma kujifunza na kupanua ujuzi wetu kunaweza kutusaidia kupanua akili zetu na kuzuia udanganyifu Kujizoeza kuwa na akili ya kujitambua kunaweza kutusaidia kutambua wakati tunapopotoshwa. Baada ya yote haya, tushirikiane kufungua mawazo yetu na kupinga udanganyifu katika jamii zetu. Chengotieno, a young religious leader representing the Catholic Church in CCC Trust. Currently, I have the privilege to hold the position of the chairperson in CCC Mombasa Euclid. Uh, to begin with, the brief background of Clark. Uh, CCC uh, is a clerical organization 
whose main purpose is to build the capacity of religious leader. In this regard, CICC Trust has been using the power of faith to transform community toward enhancing peace, development, and security. CCC Trust has worked in communities in the coast region of Kenya for over 20 years with recent entry to Garissa and Nairobi. Over these years, CCC uh, has noted that the greatest battle has been dealing uh, with half-truths and lies that drive communities asunder. The uptake of such narrative have led to conflict within communities that cause deep animosity and even violence. The most affected happen to be the youth who are easily lured and engaged uh, and used by perpetrators of violence to further their agendas. Women have also proved to be vulnerable and easily used. Generally, community of social, political, economic, education, and uh, religious vulnerability that create a thriving ground for the lies and have truth to take a hold of them. Uh, in this scenario, uh, CCC has acknowledged that the only way to win this is to engage the mind of the society by employing a variety of strategies. And just to name a few, uh, the first strategy is capacity building of religious leaders on various themes, including violence extremism, peace building, inter-religious dialogue and action. The second strategy is intra and inter-religious dialogue in which a religious leader explore honestly and soberly misinterpreted scriptures, uh, information and messages. Our third strategy is inter-religious action. This is whereby religious leaders of various faith identify and implement initiative together, for example, tree planting activity and press statement on various topics. Intercommunal dialogue is our first strategy, which is being facilitated by religious leaders in which community are, are sensitized on various themes. These are the platform in which skilled information is identified and religious leaders research further, provide feedback, and also make recommendations for further intervention. Uh, someone have proved to be the best strategy since they dissect and address key themes. In 2023, CICC religious leaders have been focusing on information sharing and verification. The someone have also proved uh, to be touching on vulnerability and community. Therefore, uncaging the mind is not an easy task. It requires patience, persistence, and frequent striking of what is happening in the community. Over 20 years of CCC work, we have noted that communities are very much equipped with tools to handle their issues. They can apply critical thinking, but they also need to understand how and when to apply this. Community also tend to be confused when there is too much information that they are not certain of. CSC uh, trust, sorry, trust building remain key to understanding the key of issues that community battles with and uh, thus working together to address them. Uh, as I conclude, you can say perpetrators of violence are never concerned about the effect of their method to realize their agenda. Currently, CSC is battling with religious radicalization in Cliff County, in which over 90 people have lost their lives due to forced fasting. In 2022, CSC Trust battled with political extremism, in which people were fed with half truth and lies. Uh, that's uh, so community deeply divided. These are just some examples of what CCC has to deal with on a daily basis. Therefore, CCC Trust remains strong and steadfast in ensuring that community can handle challenges and more so that they can pre 
present proper information to them in order to curb the rampant of half truth and lies. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, it's been thrilling to listen to everybody and consider how all the presentations are woven together. Of course, we're um, focused on um, concepts of social cohesion and then continuing on into how that um, can be uh, an intersection point across generations, across cultural contexts, across um, practices. So now that we've had a chance to have all the um, speakers uh, contribute uh, their first round of um, of points that they'd like to make. I'd love to open it up to the audience. We do have our first question, but just a reminder that you can feel free to put those into the chat um, and I'd be happy to um, include those into my moderation in the questions and answer session that we have for about um, probably 20 minutes before we wrap up. Yeah. So, and, um, so the first question that we have um, relates uh, to all of the speakers. Um, so it's been placed in the chat and um, this participant is asking, um, saying, I agree that it is necessary to address communities that have traditionally received uh, less attention in our interreligious initiatives. Um, Hannah, would you like to ask this question directly to the speakers or I can also read it if that's helpful? I should have asked that first, apologies. No, that's okay. I can, um, yeah, it's basically the question I had in the in the chat. So. I heard multiple speakers talk about how important it is to also include communities that are not traditionally included in interreligious initiatives or in dialogue. So John was very explicit about including women uh, or indigenous communities, but I also heard people say to include youth, for example. And my question is, because I fully agree with that, um, but my question is if we think we shouldn't uh, just use the traditional populations in our interreligious initiatives, what does it mean for the activities we use when we organize initiatives? So would uh, cognitive dialogical exchange be the best activity uh, to build peace or are there other activities we can think of that are more appealing to those communities that are excluded from the uh, initiatives that we organize? And I think the Wild Plans project was a beautiful example, but I just wanted to see if you had any ideas on other activities as well. Thank you, Hannah. And we can just open that up to any of the speakers that would uh, like to start and go from there. Oh, I, I can, oh. Go ahead, whoever would like to start. I heard a voice, I apologize. Okay, um, maybe to start with this, to look at what Eric was saying, there are other methods apart from just dialogue. Many youths, let me say youth and other people, don't go to a mosque, they don't go to a church, they don't go to a shrine, they don't go to a temple. So if this dialogue, if this, what we are doing has to reach them, we must go where they are. They cannot come where we are. So we use football, we use drama, we use kids, we use uh, bicycle racing, we use what the community is using to pass our message. Because it's, we have to be innovative in, in how we do. If we meet like maybe women, we ask them, can we share together in a traditional meal? They, they, they train others on how to do the cooking. And as we cook, we dialogue over an issue that is there. So we use me various methods. We don't only use dialogue, but we also use other activities that bring people together. Can I say something as well? Oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead, please. John, uh, so, thank you. Uh, yes, also, uh, you know, in, in our areas as well, in our know, plain, we have, we, we have different religious uh, religions there. Uh, Muslims, uh, Christians, Yazidis, Kakis. Uh, uh, also, we found that it is a, a dialogue is is very important, but other activities as well. Uh, for example, we've uh, conducted uh, accountability sessions. We brought uh, different religious actors together, and we together 
uh, discuss the problems that they face and also we together come up with some solutions. Also, another, for example, now we are focusing on young generations, for example, uh, collecting some or bringing some Muslims and uh, uh, Christians to visit some religious uh, uh, sites or religious, uh, another religi religious uh, religion places, like for example, Lalish, Yazidis, and the vice versa, bringing some Yazidis to visit and organize such a thing. So uh, this communication is very important. When you communicate with the other, definitely you come out with, some, with something that share, sharing uh, between them or bringing them together rather than separating them. Thank you. Could you just quickly speak a little bit? You use the phrase accountability sessions. Can you just yes. describe for the audience what you mean by that? Yes, uh, you know, if, for example, now, We've conducted so far three accountability sessions. Our study area is Hamdaniya, uh, Tilkev, and Bashira. Uh, from Hamdaniya, we've brought like 25 uh, key actors in the society, including religious uh, actors, uh, community leaders, uh, women, uh, at the same time, uh, civil society activists. And uh, when we come together, just we have moderate we are moderating just listening to them so they are they are the main uh, actors in our session like the session is about three hours uh, like that so discussing their problems and uh, what, what are the solutions the main solution for their problems and then we come out with practical recommendations and policy briefs for local authorities and NGOs and so Thank you. How to strengthen okay. the positive points that bring them together and how to mitigate the negative points that, um, that, that they have in between them the problems and make it complex. So and then they suggest the solutions and then our colleagues from the advocacy team, they write from their solutions some policy briefs for the authorities to consider to consider it for that region. Thank you, John. Uh, if I can jump in, um, I, th I think, Hannah, that at, at times, especially coming from uh, sort of the interreligious movement in the West, the, the idea was that uh, theology is why we disagree with one, one another. And if we sort of have uh, theological discussions, then all of our issues will, will go away. And therefore, the focus has been with clergy and about theology and sort of within that level. And then it has been sort of, you know, spread due to uh, uh, imperial colonial powers around the world. Uh, but the way at least uh, people have been um, doing interreligious dialogue in, in the Middle East, at least in, in, in Palestine uh, area, it's not necessarily through sitting down and talking about a specific topic, um, but actually participating in rituals together uh, and, and sharing uh, specific customs and practices uh, that, that have been mutually shared. And unfortunately, some of these have disappeared precisely because of the, the powers that, that I mentioned. Um, and again, also here, we don't always have this differentiation between what is social, political, and, and religious. Uh, for us, all of this is sort of intertwined in one big thing. Uh, so it's not a question of whether it's religion or politics, it's, it's one thing. So how, how can we rethink the way we, we engage with these communities and actually uh, strengthen indigenous forms of interreligious dialogue? All super interesting examples, and I'm very glad. I, I, I was hoping that um, uh, the speakers were more kind of uh, involved on in the, specific, like really in fostering the kind of initiatives that you were specifically asking about Hannah would speak before me. Um, I wanted to slightly, um, I wanted to approach your question from a slightly different angle. Um, because yeah, as I'm sure you can imagine the kind of lack of inclusion that you were talking about um, was really something that was born out in the case data and in the literature that we reviewed <clears throat> uh, 
Um, I mean, again, this is specifically in the context of formal peace and political transition processes, so that could potentially skew this, um, the, the sample a bit, but I mean, <clears throat> it was very, there was a sort of overwhelming focus on Christian and particularly Catholic actors and uh, a, a stark lack of documentation of kind of women, youth and indigenous, indigenous actors of faith. And <clears throat> it's not clear if uh, this is because there is just um, fewer or even a lack of these kind of actors involved in these kind of processes extremely possible, highly likely, um, or and or if it's um, a question of a lack of documentation of um, these kind of actors in these kind of processes. But um, what was interesting, because just to, to as, as part of um, uh, the process to kind of further interrogate and validate the findings, after we'd done the first stage of the research, we organized a series of consultations with faith-based actor peacebuilding practitioners around the world. So we did uh, like seven different regional consultations. And one point that kind of kept coming up, kept coming up in, 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 in different ways, but sort of variations of the same thing, um, and is related to something that I briefly talked about earlier in my presentation was how kind of inclusivity and representativeness um, are two of the determinants of the level of popular trust and therefore the legitimacy of faith-based actors. And this, there's kind of this miss something that, that faith-based actors can, it do in many cases enjoy a huge degree of popular trust, both within their own constituencies, but also among the population more broadly. But um, this isn't something that should be taken for granted, either by faith-based actors themselves or by to the population i mean like it's it's something that is is kind of earned i mean um in the sense of and um yeah in, in many many cases faith-based actors are, are some of the kind of closest actors to to the people so to speak um but that's not always necessarily the case and faith-based actors themselves brought up regularly critical questions around inclusivity and representation in terms of do they both, like along the lines of, do they fully represent their whole faith community? And is this only representing their own faith community or are they collaborating with other faith-based actors? Um, also, are they meaningfully engaging with women and youth? Um, what's their relationship to, to ruling elites? And um, a particularly pertinent issue in that respect that, again, came up in a lot of um, the different consultations, so it was sort of a global phenomenon, relates to the um, to context of majority-minority faith-based actors, which is the kind of majority of context in the world. There is one faith that is in a numerical kind of majority. Um, and in some cases in, in majority minority contexts, faith-based leaders from the majority can consider that they should have the principal say in which faith-based actors are involved in things like formal peace and political transition processes and how. Um, but yeah, many faith-based actors that we consulted in this series of, uh, of regional discussions um, stressed how in fact, a majority, the majority status of such faith-based actors only serves to enhance actually their responsibility for promoting inclusivity. And yeah, I thought that was a, just a, an interesting point to, to make. So thanks for that. Great. Well, I have a question now and I get to ask because I'm the moderator. So <laughs> while we wait for more questions to come in from the audience, um, I'm very interested as you're speaking about these projects that you're doing, um, often we consider different populations that we're interested in working with. However, an intentional component of intergenerational dialogue or projects or activities or things like that has a very different kind of impact, particularly because across generations we don't have similarities in um, what are our most pressing issues. As I was listening to um, 
um, Eric and, and the Reverend talk about um, the bringing the youth, uh, meeting the youth where they're at and doing the different kinds of activities that are important to them. So I was just really curious, generally speaking, um, about intergenerational approaches to your work. Where have you um, perhaps implemented or seen success in those kind of um, essentially cross, cross cultural within a culture um, um, dialogue or peace building activities? So just a general follow up question on that. Maybe I'll start and then I'll give to Alex. The first thing is the whole question of inclusivity. And you have to look at it and say, first of all, are we, our societies are usually inclusive in everything else they do. But when we come to issues of religion, sometimes you find there are boundaries. And so you have to ask yourself, are the women represented? You may say, yes, but what about people living with disabilities? Are they represented? Is there a minority group that is represented? You want to bring everyone in board, but at the same time, you want to look at the age, age groups. Is everyone having a say? And many times you'll find even children are left out of the conversation, but maybe they can say something out of every context. So you, we need, we always find a way of including the age. Sometimes they are left out of the, the conversation, but they have a lot of experience. So we include the age, we include the middle age, and we include the youth and the children in our conversations. At the same time, we, we, we look at gender. In CIC, we have the clergy, then we have the women desk. We call it the women desk, but it's a whole women movement in whatever place we do, and we have the youth. We try to make sure that everyone has a safe space to speak, but at the same time, we all come together and listen to one another so that we can move together in many areas. But the last, uh, my friend here is younger than me to give a perspective on that. Uh, just as Anjana said, uh, uh, we use uh, a lot of platform, especially for we youth. Uh, as you know, youth are very vulnerable. Uh, and without uh, involving them in these uh, activities or uh, issues which are, are surrounding us, then we may end up uh, uh, talking things which uh, are not uh, concerned to the youth themselves. So involving the youth is a big uh, agenda, especially in, uh, in our organization. Uh, also, uh, just as Anyenda said, uh, we always come together, including the youth, uh, the old uh, women dates, the uh, men sit together and discuss the issues they bring the agenda, what they have discussed as women, and we as youth, what we see is the way forward and uh, how we can tackle the issues surrounding that. I would like to also point to a problem we have within the field uh, at times in civil society and interreligious dialogue, uh, is, and that is of gatekeeping, um, where you have a specific individuals who are in positions of power whether that's because we receive funding from international bodies that pay for our salaries um, or whether that gives us some status within society is that then uh, many people are afraid to sort of uh, give either young people or people who, who uh, women uh, also a, a real uh, you know say in what happens so it's you know i often find that organizations have women programs as, and they say, look, we're, di we're, we're helping women as opposed to having women within the deci real decision-making uh, position. And the same thing with, with young adults uh, and youth. And also, at times, I'm confused as to what is the definition of youth and young adult. And it's, uh, it seems to constantly go up and up and up to the point that a youth is a, or a young adult is a 35-year-old who has three, four kids and a mortgage. Right. So this idea of trying to constantly, I think, at the, and this I'm speaking about my context, I can't speak for other contexts, but of all the generations really trying to uh, concentrate their power. And by doing so, they, they create these extra activities for these populations, but don't really include them in the decision making. Um, and also just looking at this uh, panel that we spoke, I just also noticed that six of the men. So, right. So how do we uh, include some of these uh, 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 voices. So this is something that we're all guilty of.
you bring up great points, John, as you're speaking. I'm just even thinking about the 35 year olds of the research projects that I'm working on. I'm thinking that seems a little bit extensive of a window to uh, give for you. Um, and any responses that people have to uh, questions that other speakers are proposing, feel free to jump in as well. Um, but just wanted to um, acknowledge the almost gauntlets that you have thrown down in, in your responses there, John. Thank you. Alex? Unless anyone Hi. wants to jump in specifically on what John just said, otherwise I was going to go off in a slightly different direction, still on you. Sure. Uh, Reverend Stephen, I just saw your hand up. Did you want to respond or are you... Yeah, I was I was going to I was going to say that um, cultural competence is is something that all of us who are actors must be must take into. Every time you come to every culture, you need to appreciate that you are coming to some culture, and there is a context that you are doing what you are doing. And my brother there said we we need also to involve everyone in decision making. You need to do this in a cultural contextual way. You have to look at how are decisions made within a certain culture and ensure that they safe space, the same topic is said, the same issues are discussed, and those issues come to the same table, and a collective decision is made so that there's ownership from all age groups and all uh, genders, um, and respecting all the cultures, religious groups that are there. Thank you. Alex, feel free to jump in. Thanks, Alison. No, no, just um, maybe beyond sort of youth movements specifically in interreligious dialogue, and this is more about kind of move, youth movements in general um, from an inclusivity perspective, as um, Reverend Stephen was uh, asking about or alluding to. Um, youth movements are actually, I mean, they're super interesting from. Uh, a point of view of inclusivity, because it's fair to say that the, the vast majority are significantly more inclusive, gender balanced and diverse than a lot of other social movements. Um, and one thing we've been thinking about recently is uh, kind of coalitions of youth movements um, cooperating beyond uh, sort of specific sectors or, or issues, because I mean, I think everyone would agree that there's we're, we're increasingly witnessing all around the world in kind of different spaces and uh, around different issues in different ways that people are kind of reclaiming and exercising their power to challenge all of the deeply entrenched systems that like engender insecurity, poverty, inequality, and distrust. And in some of those domains and um, climate justice is is a very good example of this like young people are very much in the vanguard um so it's just in the question i was wanted to actually ask is um so in terms of thinking about how the experience of the youth climate advocacy movement and in other global social justice movements that prominently feature the voices of young people uh black lives matter is a good another good example um could uh, something we've been thinking about is could that help to kind of galvanize like a global peace movement even or are there ways in which youth um uh youth movements around other kind of causes issues in in different sectors and spaces could um yeah discuss could, could we broaden the kind of like interreligious dialogue i mean along the lines that john was talking about between kind of lay secular actors uh, specifically around youth and um, think about how yeah we can bring sort of youth from different spaces around different issues together to to think about um, yeah more kind of what they have in common and even share experiences of how um, successful in instances of advocacy have worked and how um, those kind of strategies might be transferable to other uh, other sectors and issues yeah uh, may, may, may I also some, uh, say something related to our uh, area of study? Actually, we found that, and uh, the in terms of uh, also young generation and youth, uh, we've also found that even their views uh, related to problems uh, that the area is has faced uh, and the solutions, the, their view is different from ours, particularly. Uh, particularly now, 
uh, who are in control are the what, what is called in our area, whether in Hamdania or in all Nano you know, plain, who are in control of, uh, let's say, uh, 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 proposing the, the uh, identifying or identifying the problems and proposing the solution are elders or community councils, what you call community councils. Now, Christian, they have the community. Uh, uh, Yazidis, they have or Shabaks, all of the community, they have their councils, and all of the members. Oh, we found that all of the members are elders, like above, let's say, about John, about 35, not even under 35. So, we found that even young generation are not included in these uh, councils. So, we found if if they've been like involving of young generation in the councils of uh, leaders, as well as in some uh, uh, positions, like important position in the society, they might propose something different, particularly because the young generation, as I say in my presentation, are, are the lead that has been affected by ICE ideologies. And the elder generation also, they want to, like sometimes, okay, there is a problem. In social media, we see that the young generation, they propose something that this problem is big, but when it comes to, other, to elders, they say, oh, this problem is nothing, or they minimize the problem. Like, okay, they just wanna deny that there is a problem, but the young generation are frank, and now they are impacting the society, not through councils or, uh, 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 let's say, administrative or political position through social media. That's why we found that in, in our naked steps, we also going to focus mostly on young generation, how to involve them or how to, uh, let's say, uh, communi make communication between them and elder uh, people. Thank you. Great. Um, we had one more question come in that, of course, is not um, an easy to answer in the last two minutes of the session. Um, so I'm going to invite the participant if they'd like to, to ask the question and then ask the speakers um, an impossible task of keeping uh, your answer succinct as we kind of uh, invite people to contribute if possible. Um, Frederic, would you like to come on camera and ask your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, hi, uh, my name is Friederike, and I wrote my master thesis on the conflict in Cabo de Gado, Mozambique. And my main conclusion was the fact that uh, it's not a religious conflict per se, but that um, re radicalization is used as a means, means of rebellion and changing the strat status quo because uh, of the poverty, the vicious circle that the youth finds this itself in. So I'm asking myself, uh, when the youth is already radicalized, what can we do uh, considering the reality on the ground uh, to reach uh, these youth that are already on the other side? Thank you. The whole question of social justice, and I'm speaking in, in, in Africa and mostly in Kenya, where we are in Mombasa, the whole question of social justice, you know, the redistribution of resources, inclusivity, and all this kind of thing, and mostly when it comes to the youth, is something that we need to keep thinking about. Um, but as soon as a youth has been radicalized and um, or is in, involved in radical or in violent extremism, um, then we need to start looking at the whole question of disengagement and the radicalization. And as CICC, as Coast Center for Council of Clerics, we, we normally work with this kind of youth, but we don't only work with them to, to, to say, these are the issues that made you think like this. We, we, we work with them in, in the whole, whole area of mental health, in the whole area of changing their perspective, depending with how they were radicalized, what pathway they used. 
uh, what are the issues that were involved. We will get other people who are experts into that to speak to them, but at the same time to attach them because many times it is to do with the poverty and the issues like that. Then we must ask ourselves, then how does this young person get out of that? One, maybe they don't have training. Can we involve them in vocational training institutions? Can we also attach them to mentors who are working in an area of interest so that the young person is not only complaining, but they are using their energy to say, okay, if you disengage, if you de-radicalize, um, we are able to help you go into a school or get into a vocational training. And then after that, give you a mentor. And then after that, get you someone else who can help you start off. It is always a process. It's not an, a quick fix. Is a process. It takes about a year, two years, three years uh, to get a young person back on the road. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, looking at the time and wanting to respect everybody's schedules for today, I appreciate all of your participation, your questions. Um, the ways that you've engaged with one another offline before we even began our session and then of course today as well. Um, I'm so pleased that you could all make it and, and share your perspectives on your particular um, projects, research, cultures, populations. Um, and of course, I couldn't help but plant that seed for uh, my youth question. So thank you for thank you for uh, letting me jump in myself with, with that personal question. So um, I appreciate everyone's time and I wish you a wonderful uh, rest of the conference. There are so many exciting sessions to uh, attend and look forward to. So wishing you all the best and um, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alison. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Okay. Thank you, everybody.